Hello, welcome to Business Week, the program that brings you top business stories that made the headlines during the course of this week, including special news features, market data, interviews, and much more. Welcome to the show. Well, here's the highlight of the biggest stories we track for you over the course of this week. Now, on the local front, crude production in Nigeria has dropped to 1.37 million barrels per day in the month of October from 1.39 million barrels per day earlier recorded. And now, the CBN has also fixed 5 billion naira as the maximum loan amount that a participant can get in the 100 for 100 policy on production and productivity. And still staying with reports from the CBN, banks' money and credit statistics shows that Nigeria's credit to the private sector has hit another all-time high of 3.8 trillion naira as of September this year. Let's now shift our attention to the foreign scene as Bitcoin rallied towards its all-time high of $68,564 and Ether also climbed to a fresh record of $4,825 $4,825 as cryptocurrencies rode on a wave of momentum flows and favorable news as well as inflation fears are at the start of this week. And cash Strata China Evergrande Group has also faced its deadline on Wednesday for making an offshore bond payment while credit rating downgrade on another property firm added to mounting concerns about a liquidity squeeze in the sector. Global Miners BHP Group has also signed a deal to sell its stake in BHP Me2 Coal, a metallurgical coal joint venture in Queensland to Scanmore Resources Limited for up to $1.35 billion. Well, it's now time to bring you special packages prepared by our correspondents. We have reports from the maritime sector and also highlights of commemoration of activities of the International Accounting Day, as well as looking at fuel shortages and the preparation we have ahead of festivities. Port users, especially importers and freight forwarders, have been raising objections to what they allege are unfair trade practices by shipping companies in the country. Top among their growls is the charges they are forced to incur for the transfer of their cargoes to bonded terminals without their consent. Freight forwarders are already gearing for a showdown with shipping companies with the threat of withdrawal of service. But the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Shippers Council is giving assurances that compliance to trade guidelines would be enforced while urging port users and operators to take advantage of the agency's compliance platform to give notification of infractions. There were specific requests that were made that we needed to be given information and evidence, you know, to back up the allegations of infractions that have been made. But whatever we do, we, you know, we want to give out, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the right signals, you know, that speaks to the industry that you now have uh, uh, a body that is actually responsible for ensuring that there is fairness in the way the business is conducted in our ports. He maintains that as the port economic regulator, the council has a responsibility to all stakeholders, while also noting that the Nigerian Port Process Manual is an available instrument for compliance mechanism. Government, I think in its wisdom, decided to put in place a platform, uh, and that is the NPPM, which is a platform that is now giving us the teeth to be able to also enforce and sanction and to make sure that people are really, you know, you know, uh, be, being guided by the rules. Uh, and, I, 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 and I think to the extent that that platform has begun, you know, to bear fruits. He further states that the Nigerian Shippers Council still retains the mandate to ensure businesses are done at less cost, but efficiently at the nation's seaports. Ifunanya Eze, TVC News, Lagos. This group of 1,242 inductees and 13 registered accountants have now become chartered after scaling through their professional exams mandated by the Institute. With this induction, they have now joined millions of chartered accountants across the world and the over 55,000 members of the Institute. While addressing these newly inducted members, the president of ICANN, Mrs. Comfort Eitayo, calls for the accuracy and integrity of the members, as the slogan of the body implies. 
The guest speaker was also the former president of ICANN, Al Haji Razak Jayola, also charged the accountant to pursue available further knowledge to improve their technical skills. You must tread the path of honor when conflict arises between your professional dictates and the urge to undermine the oath you would swear in allegiance to high ethical and professional conduct. Whatever knowledge that you have today, given the technology age, is not static. Things are changing. I'm sure we all did IFRS in our exams. If I can remember correctly, when I was teaching IFRS, IAS 18 was for revenue recognition. Today, it's no longer. The ICANN president also announced that the institute has reviewed downward the number of years to become an associate of full member from five to three years. The institute's governing council, in its wisdom, recently reduced the requisite number of years from five to three years. I encourage all our registered accountants to take advantage of this opportunity. The induction ceremony is coming on the heels of the commemoration of the International Accounting Day, a day set aside worldwide to celebrate all professional accountants for their roles in nation building, growth, and development. Adesha Waldushoga, TVC News, Lagos. As the festive season approaches, the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority have met with the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, and other key stakeholders in the petroleum product supply and distribution value chain to adopt new measures to prevent petroleum scarcity and maintain stability in the downstream sector of the nation's petroleum industry. This stakeholders' engagement is coming on the eves of looming petrol crisis and panic buying of the products by some Nigerians across the country amid reports of a likely price increase by marketers. Reading out resolutions agreed upon by these stakeholders at this meeting in Lagos, the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority, Mr. Farouk Ahmed, disclosed that under the new agreement adopted, they agreed to remove all hindrances capable of stalling supply of petroleum products nationwide. The following items were agreed upon for immediate action. Number one, NNPC assures supply, and uh, supply of sufficient PMS to the country. Nigeria Midstream Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority to engage stakeholders on the reconciliation of bridging claims, the current bridging and the administrative charges shall continue to apply. What it means is that, just to, to explain, the bridging shall continue. So transporters are assured of continuous bridging and payment of their claims. On the issue of movement of petroleum products, stakeholders here agreed that agencies involved should immediately revert to the Naira-denominated invoices of excess capacity of the distribution of the product using the investors' and exporters' window rates for the time being. The PIA has been passed. There's a process that has been in place, and there's a timeline in the, in the PIA where we'll get to that point. But in the interim, we have already arranged for, a stakeholder, uh, for an engagement with our key stakeholders early next quarter, quarter, uh, early next year, maybe the first quarter of next year, to review all this in line with the transition and uh, uh, transition committees that we have established in order to have a smooth uh, transition, a smooth uh, uh, move from the current, yeah, yeah, smooth implementation. As this meeting comes to a successful close, the NMDPRA assures Nigerians of adequate petroleum products during and after the festive season, urging them to avoid any form of panic buying. Blessed Omanose, TVC News, Lagos.
Well, it's now time to bring you our feature on the show today as we take a look at Nigeria's external reserves, which is sustaining a much more robust outlook. Don't go anywhere. Many thanks for still staying with us. Let's now deal with the crux of today's discourse. One of the highlights we've seen so far in this month as well is the report that Nigeria's external reserves rose by $5.05 billion in the month of October, according to latest data from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Now, the reserves increased from $36.78 billion in September the 30th to $41.83 billion on the 29th of October. Now, the Deputy Governor Financial System Stability Directorate of the CBN at the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting in Abuja said the external sector trend improved as reflected in the balance of trade position, which also narrowed by 52.56% to a deficit of 1.87 trillion naira in the second quarter of this year, from 3.94 trillion naira in the first quarter. Now, this is also largely driven by 74.72% rise in exports, which outstrips the increase in imports of 1.45%. She further notes that external reserves increased by 7.41% at the end of the month of August this year, from 3.43 billion naira in the month of July. Now, according to this report as well, relative stability was maintained at the importers and exporters window uh, following sustained implementation of policies aimed at boosting liquidity and improving supply to meet legitimate demands for transactions. And now joining me to discuss this and much more, I have Adiola Ojo, an economist, to look at our external reserves. Thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much, sir. Well, we have seen a steady rise in the country's external reserves uh, uh, since the month of August this year, up until now, the initial fear was the the benchmark hitting as low as $30 billion at the peak of the COVID-19. But that fear seems to have been muted or silenced. Now, in terms of the fact that we've also seen a shift from the upward-downward trajectory, do you see a situation where we'll see a steady rise in the external reserves, or we will likely see a plateau case in point issues around increased exports, uh, the special drawing right allocations of uh, $3.35 billion from the IMF, looking at eurobonds and much more. What do you see playing out? Basically, I would say that um, we are still going to be having uh, a, a little drop, actually. It, there's going to be a, a drop, not a sharp drop, um, uh, going forward. Because so this, the thing that actually contributed to the growth that we have witnessed now um, will not repeat itself again or will not come on board again, especially maybe in the next one or two months. Um, the first one, as we have um, been informed, is the special drawing right, which we mentioned earlier, uh, $3.35 billion that came in through that platform. And also we saw that um, there was also a level of uh, increase in our um, exports and the increment actually uh, contributed in a way, to the growth that we also saw there, we could also say in one way or the other that uh, Eurobond um, that was uh, issued by government, the, the income from it also came in, in to that platform. And indeed, when, when you saw um, or when we analyzed what actually came in, we could actually say, OK, those things will not repeat itself again, especially for Eurobond and the uh, SDR, the special drawing rights from IMF. And if those two should be taken off the, the, the platter, a bit from the platform, then invariably we're going to see, it may not be a sharp drop, but a drop even in what we have there. We saw this happen uh, in, briefly around the first week of November uh, when some payments were made from their accounts. And thank God that it's back now to the plate you that it is. But I think at the end of the month, uh, there's going to be a change to what we already see. And now, but some also argue that irrespective of the absence of the volume that we are seeing from the likes of the special drawing rights come next month or the preceding months into the new year, it would only be a small marginal decline we'll likely see between this month and next month. Others also argue that that's why we've seen some increase in our export base and earnings just a little bit. Uh, not enough has been done to consolidate the export base to become a much more sustainable base for more foreign exchange inflows. What are your thoughts on these? I would say for the year of other small uh, marginal decline that we are, gonna, are going to have, yes, it may be. But when we look at the historical antecedents, 
and what has been happening since the beginning of the year, uh, we saw that um, one or two things that actually brought about uh, the, decrease, uh, the decrease or the reduction in the Forex uh, reserve level uh, is as a result of uh, uh, the one, uh, when we have shortages in our uh, Forex that is coming in, then we also saw also that as a result of the payments that we made from that account, it's um, coming up and, and so those payments are still there. And remember that our uh, Nigerian uh, year end is uh, January to December and another December is approaching some of the debts that needs to be paid. And federal government have told us that their first uh, priority is to pay, that is in debt payment, is to pay foreign debts first before they pay the one for uh, the domestic uh, debts. So uh, the year is coming to an end. So there are some debts that still need to be paid. Maybe their maturity level has not approached and they may uh, uh, mature by this month or by December. So payments will still be made from that at a, uh, account. And if payments are made, uh, invariably, we're going to see a drop in that platform. Subsidy is still in place. And if payments are going to be made for subsidy, it's still going to go down even on that platform. Then we still have letters of credit uh, that will mature uh, before the end of the year. And if payments also are, if they are also considered, then in one way or the other, we're going to say that uh, there is going to, we're still going to have some level of uh, reduction even in the forex uh, reserve. So the best way we can actually uh, grow it is for us to pump in more uh, dollar or forex into into that uh, uh, into the reserves that we have. And how do we do that? Looking at that, uh, an historical accident of uh, uh, forex management in Nigeria, um, we may not be able to have much even to come in uh, substantially that it just came in in the last two months. We saw that happen from January up to July. And apart from those little things that happened around August, September, uh, October that we saw that we are reporting now, there's nothing much substantial that we think may actually happen after now. Okay, now, how do you also see us beginning to have much more liquidity in the Forex market and improve uh, supply for legitimate demands as well? We need to just really silence this noise of uh, Forex scarcity, this menace, this bottleneck stifling businesses, tech sectors like the manufacturing and aviation sector, they're badly hit by these Forex issues in the country. Uh, for us to be able to say we want to boost the uh, Forex um, in the country, that how, to, how can we increase or improve on it? I think the first thing I would suggest is that we need to, and that has been what every other person across the world have been shouting, and be also telling Nigerians and the Nigerian government and the monetary authority, we need to unify. We need to unify the forex uh, exchange market. Um, I would suggest that as of now, especially with the things and, and the way I'm, uh, man now we have um, dealt with the broad change, uh, we actually see that most of the instability that we've seen is actually from that angle. And um, demand has not been met supply is short and we have so many uh, unstable situation around so i would say we should unify this the, the market find a way to to bring everybody if possible under the investors and exporters window i in window so that everybody have access to the same platform just like the stock exchange we have access to this common market Everybody now, we, we want us to bring things, bring money into the economy, we want us to increase for So let everybody have a common market where both the supply and the demand of uh, uh, forex, uh, either dollar or pounds or whatever, can be available. Then we all assess it. And you know, in the process of assessing or other for demand or for supply, then the pricing will be done rightly. Then everybody will be happy for it. Wrapping up our conversation at this point in time, let's now look into more incentives or initiatives and efforts by the CBN to bring a bigger pull into the external reserves. Now, in your own assessment, what do you make of the volume we've seen from the Naira for Dollar initiative and how much you think this is also likely bringing a more sustainable pull to the purse? And what other incentives or initiatives do you think we can see beyond uh, diaspora remittances? Prior to the Naira for Dollar initiative, by the federal government, by the CBN, we saw that already the repatriation of uh, dollar, especially to the economy, has been a bit poor. And many people are trying to do a whole lot of things, um, trying to find alternative ways of uh, getting dollar. And some people are actually having uh, offshore accounts to keep this dollar. 
um, in order for them to be able to meet the needs. And as a result of that, the economy is suffering. So the their policy actually helped to um, encourage some Nigerians and some also other uh, partners with Nigeria to be able to bring in dollar through the official channel. And as a result of that, we saw a, a, a jump, that is an improvement in repatriation uh, for the first period, even for the first weeks, and even till now. And I think that it's as a result of the good, um, the results that they got. That was why CBN actually had to extend it in May, uh, when they first started in March, and they said, okay, they saw the good results, they saw the, the, the level of uh, returns, they now said, okay, please go ahead, going forward, this is a good initiative. And remember that before then, they are put into place, uh, they have registered and they have licensed some IMTOs, the National Ministry Transfer Organization or whatever, or that, or whatever to be able to um, bring in, to be able to help to repatriate funds. And those ones are still there. So uh, all the initiatives that are put in place, I think the result has been good. But like I said, and I will still restate here, it is not the best. Many people still do underground work. And lastly now, one of the biggest issues, the elephant in the room, is the fact that we cannot shoo this away just easily. The oil price rally we've seen in the market is robust, hence uh, more money for Nigeria. But simultaneously, we also have an immediate dip into that pool. As you see, uh, the fuel subsidy regime still persists. We're still repaying loans and a whole lot more. Now, looking at uh, the 2022 budget proposal already presented and under scrutiny, uh, we don't have any provision for uh, subsidy regime following June 2022. Some also say that, well, we might likely see an extension. How much of a buffer do you think we'll see by the time we have an end to the subsidy regime? How much do you see coming to the external reserves? At one time or the other, there are some payments that are important that needed to be taken from those platform. One of it is uh, we government is trying to pay for subsidy. It goes in. So subsidy is one little element of that. Yes, most of the time we say we are paying. How much is even is the subsidy we are paying? When we calculate it in error, we say it's much. Oh, 100 billion, 1 billion error or 200 billion error is what we are using as subsidy. It is not enough to look at either the accretion that we see. Subsidy is only minute. Even the Commonwealth, uh, the Washington Convention, sir, in economics, Washington Convention uh, even spoke about the issue of subsidy. There are things you should subsidize to make your economy better, especially, for example, one of the things you should subsidize are things that can tilt, that affect the people ordinarily. And you know in Nigeria, crude oil prices, I mean, uh, the prices of your uh, petrol, whatever, goes a long way to determine a lot of things in this country. And you know the purchasing power of your people is not much. So subsidy shouldn't be a major point for us. Yes, you say remove the subsidy, but when you remove the subsidy, what happens to the people? What happens to the people? So please, sir, let us, I just want to uh, appeal to the people, to the government. Yes, let us grow. But the major thing that takes money from the foreign reserve is not subsidy. It is not subsidy. It is public debt, payment of foreign debt. And we should look at that going forward. Well, thank you very much for your time on the show today, Adiola Ojo. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, now, but just before we go now here, let us bring you some graphic details of the internally generated revenue at state level for the first half of this year. A report prepared by the National Bureau of Statistics. Well, that's it on this edition of Business Week. Many thanks for watching so far. Do enjoy the rest of your weekend and bye for now.